So I hope everybody's here to learn something about wild edibles because that's definitely what we'll be talking about. And I just like to kind of warm up and ask people's interest, their personal interest. Why are we interested in wild edibles? We got a pretty good crowd here. I normally do small stuff, you know, 10 or 15 people outside. This is a little bit different for me because it's inside, but I think we'll have just as good a time and we'll learn a few plants. But does anybody want to throw anything out? Why are we interested in wild edibles? I just want to know what's in my yard that I can eat. What we can eat in our yard. That's great. Some other people similar. Yeah, so I'd like to just learn how to eat more natural things that aren't from a store. Yeah, that's good. Okay, go ahead. I was hiking on a property and I found this really big mushroom that I thought was mushroom in here. Yeah. And I smelled it and I smoked it. And I bugged it up to this big bit. It might be here for about an hour. I tried to the car, went home, did Google research, turned out to be a cauliflower mushroom. Crushed it and ate it and I thought it was fantastic. So I want to learn more about what's from the local and what and how to how to make sure that I don't eat the wrong thing. Yeah, so you've had a good experience. That's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah, that's pretty good, pretty good. Um so a few days ago I went somewhere. And do we recognize this place? It's in LJ. Oh, there's the park. Well, it's the park, right? There's the river and that little spring head down here. Where there's water. So do we know where we're talking about, the, the, at least the people from LJ here? This is just at the park, and I would say that this is not an area that anybody has purposely tried to grow food, right? In fact, I would say that it's an area where they aren't encouraging diversity or food or edible plants, because I think they spray a little bit up and down the, the river here, and they like probably that grassy lawn. You know, those are okay things, but they don't encourage food plants and diversity. But even so, I went in here, and basically from this picture, I started walking right in here, and I only spent 30, 40 minutes here, and I gathered a, quite a few pictures, and that's kind of what we're going to look at. So because I can't take you outside into a plant walk today, we're going to do a virtual plant walk at the park, where we all can hopefully go there and see you know, these plants in person, see them, and how they um, look similar and different to the plants around them. So there's... There's quite a few plants here. It's a good area. LJ in general is a really diverse area. And speaking of the whole Southeast, it's one of the most diverse places, probably in the world, but at least in the United States, it's the most diverse. And so there's a lot of plants here. It's a great place to study edible plants, but it can also be super overwhelming. So we're just gonna really scratch the surface. There's not enough time to go deep into detail, but we can take a look at a few plants that you can find all over. You find them at the park, you'll probably find them in your own yard. So zooming in here, I found something growing along the ground. This is a little herbaceous plant. It doesn't get that tall. Do we recognize it? Violet? Violet, yes, very good. Um, so these are kind of like a little heart-shaped thing going on right there. And you have a little bit of, you know, wavy edges here, almost little serrations. And then you can see the other thing you'll kind of want to look at is how these veins come out. So this is a, a very typical violet leaf. And this is one of the purple violets, so I'll just say, uh, simply put, and they grow absolutely all over. There are tons of species of violets in the world and they grow all over the world, except for in the most extreme conditions. So you can really go anywhere in the world and take advantage of this great food. Now I know it's just a leafy green, it's not, you know, your french fries you get at the fast food restaurant, but you could substitute this for any, any store-bought green and it's going to be much more nutritious. So that's one reason why we want to take advantage of wild edibles is they're gonna really be so much more nutritious than anything we can buy in the grocery store. It's because it's not been cultivated. And cultivating is when we take a plant, typically we make it produce more, we make it produce better, we make it produce less bitter tasting compounds, we make it more sweet, more sugary, and we make it where we, it can last on a shelf, right? So those things, when you go into the grocery store, that's the focus of your food. Is it sweet and will it last on a shelf? Does it have carbohydrates? Because that's really what we're after in this society. So violets aren't those things. It's not going to last a super long time after you pick it. And um, it's definitely not that sweet, but it's really, really mild. And a lot of wild greens, it's a great place to start with wild edibles, the greens, because there's a ton of them that are really safe and really healthy. This is a really mild one, so there's not a whole lot of taste there. This I put in anything, and you, it's, just, it's just there for the leafy matter. It's not really a tasteful plant. I have a question. Do you eat the flower it produces? 
in yeah. your, the stems and roots? So I eat the aerial portions of this plant. So that would be leaves, and the stems will be okay, though I might avoid them. I might kind of just pick the end of the leaf. Okay. If you take your thumb, you know, at somewhere right here, right here, you can just pick that leaf off and you can go through a yard and you can pick them. You can really pick a lot very easily, enough for like, let's say, scrambled eggs or something like that. You know, it's just going in whatever dish, a soup, a stew, just going in there with some ground beef, whatever you like to cook. Substitute your store-bought leafy greens for a wild violet and the nutrient content's going to go way up. So, you know, we're looking at here, vitamin C, for weight for weight, twice as much as an orange. Twice as much vitamin A as spinach. I mean, I'm not, you know, there's plenty of research that tells us these plants are more nutritious than what we're buying in the grocery store. So it turns out that nutrition, I'm gonna vary just a little bit off wild edibles, but it all pertains, but that nutrition can also be absorbed through our skin. So our skin's a very large organ of the body and it most certainly absorbs what you put on it. You put all kinds of probably oils, salves, makeup, maybe. It's gonna absorb some things from that. And that same nutrition that's good for us to ingest is good for healing our skin. So violet is something I'll harvest to put in a salve, you know, for, for beat up hands or for cuts and bites and scrapes. It's a nutritive for the body and also for the skin. So it's a really utilitarian plant that grows just about everywhere. You can see it was just really near the, um, near the concrete there, I believe, and just in the sand and just waste areas, roadside, sidewalks, your garden probably. Um, but it's a very welcome plant in my garden. So. Violet, and this is viola species. Just to kind of say what this means up here. Um, if you know, there's these common names that we use that I like to use because they're easy. And then there's science, what we'll call scientific names. And it typically is two words when you see a plant's scientific name. The first one is the genus, which is essentially a form of that plant and its family. So plants can all be lumped together in different families. And the genus here is viola and the species the specific one I'm talking about, like we have um, what they call like the confederate violet or the purple and white flowered one that comes in and then they have the purple violet too. Well they're both violas but they're two different species. And what I'm saying here is that all the violets, all the viola species are edible. You don't need to know the specific species, you just need to make sure you have a violet. And identification factors are similar shaped leaves to this violet and also the flower would be um, something good to learn because the flower really gives away what plant it is. Now there weren't any flowers at the park uh, three days ago. So this is what you get. This is what you gotta be able to identify. It's not always gonna be perfect. And I'll always say use more than one identifying factor. Don't just be like, oh, it had, it had veins in the leaf. That must be it, you know? <laughs> well, they all have veins in the leaves, right? So always look for more than one identifying factor. Um, what does the root of that look like? The root is little, it kind of, it, it's almost like little nodes underneath it. And I don't know of an edibility there, but it can be transferred um, if it's not already popping up in your waste areas. I just don't remember seeing a flower on what I have that looks like that. Yeah. With well, shade and things like that can be different factors. Um, it's hard to say. But there's a lot of violet species. Another thing you can do is, eat, um, if you're looking for identification, I'm not saying I can help every time, but I have business cards over there, and I'll put up the website. You can email me pictures, and maybe I can help. I think you can email the Extension um, office, and they can help identify things. And if you're looking to identify things based on pictures, you want pictures of the front and the back of the leaf of any flower, and sometimes the petiole or the stem area. So. The violets, once you learn to recognize them, are really easy to recognize. Like I say, there's two or three that have a purple flower that are all over LJ, and there is a yellow flowered violet um, called the halberd leaf violet, and it's in the forest more. And it's got a really pretty leaf. If you've ever seen kind of a heart-shaped leaf, but it's, it's longer and pointier than these, and it has this two-tone two -tone color going on, um, and it's in the forest, it has little yellow flowers. Those are violets too, and those are edible as well. So all the species of violets, you can go around the world and find your violets if you can recognize that flower, that plant. They all vary a little bit, but they're all close enough to identify. Okay, right beside that, I found another plant. Do we have any guesses or any, any idea? This is a plant we've all heard of, I can guarantee it. It's not sumac. It's not sumac. That's a good guess. I mean, I like that guess. It's, I can see why you'd say that. Um, 
if it had flowers or berries, more people might recognize it, but it doesn't right now. It already, it already flowered and it already fruited and the birds got most of them, but a lot of people probably try to get these berries as well. So a couple things to notice before I give it away is these little humps, right? These are like little lenticels. They're just, it's almost like a warty stem or a bumpy stem. So it's smooth, it, it runs, the bark runs up and down, it's smooth, but it has all these little humps on it. And this is what we call a compound leaf. So one of these sets of leaves, like this little, if I circle this whole thing, that's one leaf. And these are little leaflets. So we'll, we might can go a little bit more into that, but that gets a little deep. The point is, I'm just trying to get you to recognize the what this plant really looks like, besides just kind of glossing over, right? So we have compound leaves, so there's multiple little leaflets on each big leaf. It has this woody stem, but it also has a lot of green growth. It's elderberry. So this is a this picture was not at the park. These pictures were from the park yesterday, so you can go find that and get an up close look at it. This is a picture from our property earlier in the year when the berries were just starting to get ripe. So these are there's several Sambucus species or several elderberries in the United States, about three of them. There's a European, there's the Canadian or the American, and then there's a red elderberry out west. I don't know much about the red elderberry out west. Here, commonly along the roadsides, and I mean this is everywhere along the roadsides. It's kind of unfortunate the way the roadsides are managed because there's a lot of good medicine growing in those plants. So, um, so elderberries, they grow in those waste areas once again. They especially like it if there's a little bit of water around and they can produce really heavy, heavily. Now, has anybody just picked off the plant and eaten an elderberry? I mean, maybe somebody's done that. Probably would have been seen as a mistake if you had done that. Two or three berries, you're probably going to start getting pretty nauseous. So it's toxic when wrong. So this isn't something we can just go out in the field, pick a bucket up and start feasting on. There's a lot of berries like that, but this is not one of them. In fact, the whole plant's considered raw. These stems right here are really long and straight and they're hollow inside. So it's enticing if you find dead elderberry stems, maybe to pick it up and, you know, as a child, you might use it as a blow dart gun or use it, you know, to blow your fire or something like that. And it's, it's gonna be mildly toxic to touch and play with these, the leaf and the stem of elderberry. Now, I've never had an issue going in, picking my berries and getting out, but just around the sensitive areas like the eyes, the mouth, things like that. So if you do get to the berries before the birds do, there are a lot of great uses for them and they are completely edible when properly prepared. And we obviously, we've, everybody's heard about elderberry syrup, right? And we're probably hearing about how that's good. You might've heard some controversy about it with recent events, but primarily it's really good and it's been proven Many studies show that it helps shorten um, cold and flu symptoms and it's kind of seen as a broad spectrum antiviral. But more, more importantly than that, you can eat it, you just want to remove the seeds. Okay, and a little bit of heat in the preparation. So a lot of people use heat to make their syrup. I can give you a quick recipe on elderberry syrup because this is a good way to ingest this plant. I know you're kind of like, well, it's a really small berry and you know you got to remove the seeds and it has this little edible part is this really worth it you know and yes we have to work a little bit harder for these wild foods um, but it can be very much worth it in the nutrient profiles uh, in this case antioxidants flavonoids that can come out any deeply pigmented berry like those even just a blueberry a cranberry a um, hawthorn berry beauty berry the elderberries, all that deeply pigmented color, that is the flavonoids, that is the antioxidants. So it's good to get that color in your life. And you know, when you make a syrup, that color just darkens and thickens and concentrates. So those compounds are still there. So you can still take advantage even after cooking, even after the heat, there's a lot of nutrient left in the elderberries. So it's not a big calorie intake, but it's gonna be something good for general health. I recommend you know doing something like a blueberry or a hawthorn berry or even an elderberry syrup, um, but especially those milder berries like blueberries that you can just eat. Do a syrup of that. Now I'm talking about a syrup that's made with just honey and the berry. There's no sugar. There's no preservatives. Um, and I'll give you a little recipe. But you take that that primitive uh, jam or jelly and you store it in the fridge because there aren't any preservatives. The honey to water content. The honey's not high enough to really make it preserve. So you can take that stored in the fridge and, and do that daily. Do it with blueberry syrup, but stuff that you make yourself, because the stuff you buy in the store is just not gonna be the same. It's gonna have a lot of other stuff in it.
So elderberries, they're really good to ingest, but you have to prepare them properly. And a quick syrup recipe, I'll try to simplify this as much as I can because this applies to all our berries. You can use any berry for this. You will make a decoction or a strong tea. So that means in this case of elderberry, my elderberries are in my little pot and I kind of get that simmering and popping and boiling just a little bit. I don't go overkill, I don't boil it like crazy, but I get it warm and I get bubbles forming and I'm kind of mashing it up just a little. I'm not smashing it, I'm not trying to crush seeds or anything, but I'm just kind of working that pulp around. And then I'll strain that out and you'll have this, this you know, saturated liquid. It's really colorful, it's really pretty. From there you will take that after you strain your berries and simmer it down about halfway. So you're reducing the volume by half. And that's gonna concentrate it even further. You're evaporating off moisture and just leaving those colorful pigments behind that, that really help the body in the sense of uh, flavonoids and antioxidants. After you get it down to about 50% volume, you add in that same 50% of honey while it's warm. It'll all mix up really nice when you have an elderberry syrup. Now this one, I really love the fact that it's downtown and we have eaten berries off this tree downtown. Um, it, you can get to them just about every year if you get to them now. If everybody in the room goes to it, there's only one tree, so there's not going to be enough, but <laughs> give it a taste the next time you get the opportunity. These berries, known as mulberry, ripen, um, what, mid-June? Mid-June uh, in the park there. So this was last year's picture. We didn't, or was it this year's? I don't know. This was in one or two years ago, and then these pictures I took just yesterday. Um, the berries look kind of weird, but I assure you they're delicious. There's nothing needs to be added for these berries. Has anybody heard of mulberry or tried it? Yeah, so it's the name, the, the species of mulberries, there's two or three, I'll go into a little bit of detail. It, it's been common, um, commonly talked about, and it probably started with the paper mulberries, what, in the 1800s? Um, there was the silkworms, anybody remember history from like middle school? Um, <laughs> There was the paper mulberries, uh, you know, and they wanted it for the silkworms. So they, they really like pushed paper mulberries on small homesteaders and small farms to say, hey, you can make money if you, if you get these mulberries, get the silkworms and sell the silkworms back to us. Well, it never really took off. I mean, it's not big industry nowadays, um, at least not in, in America or the Southeast. And those paper mulberries, are that's kind of good because we don't really want those anyways. So those are good fiber. Those are good for the silkworms. But what we want is the red mulberries, the native red mulberries. So if you're seeing this fruit, the mulberry is good to eat and you know it's a mulberry. There's not many fruits that look like that. There's plenty of cultivars of this plant. These mulberries could be twice as long on some cultivars, really large fruit. Mulberries are, are sweet enough to make a sugar or a syrup out of. If you, you know, boil them down and, and extract all that, you don't even have to add sweetener. So you could actually make a crystallized refined sugar from the mulberries. Um, and that's been done in a lot of other countries because this plant is all over the world. Now the bark here has got this linear appeal and it's, you can see it's starting to get a little bit of this X mark. It's probably not as good as an example as I would have liked because the tree there, this is the whole tree, it's a little hard to see, but it's not a large tree. These branches are down around my head and it's easy to pick a few berries. But the fiber or the bark is a really good fiber. And the Cherokee and the Native Americans that had mulberry access would use that bark for fiber. They would eat the berries too. So this is a reliable fruit producing tree, which means it can produce once, if not twice a year sometimes, if pruned properly. So this is a tree I like to mention to create a food resilient community. I can think of a few reasons why we'd want a, few, a food resilient community. Um, if our food is local, it's hard to take it away if it's growing in our yard, isn't it? You know, it's hard to have a shortage of food that's growing in your, in your front yard. So I highly encourage people to plant the mulberry trees. There's plenty of nurseries. I don't have a lot right now. We do serve a function of a small nursery, uh, but I don't have the mulberries, but there's plenty of places to get them. And get a cultivar while you're at it. You know, it's going to be a heavier fruit producing tree. There's ever bearing varieties. Um, but if you want just a native red, red mulberry too, that's, that's great. And that's probably what this is. This is a pretty standard mulberry. Now you want to get them when they're this deep purple color. Some of these were a little underripe and they're going to be a little tart like most berries, but this deep purple, some of them get almost black. And just to make it clear, when I say red mulberry or white mulberry, it's not the color of the mulberry. It's just the title of the tree. All the mulberries native are this color. 
this deep, deeper color when they're ripe. So you will, like at Ingalls, for instance, I, it may have been a year ago the last time I looked, but they had dried mulberries at Ingalls. They were imported from another country and they were white and there are white mulberries, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about red and white mulberries that look, that have mulberries that look like this. They're two different species and they're crossbreeding in the Southeast here. So it doesn't really matter which one you have or which one you think it is. It's just a mulberry tree. One of the, one of the red or white combinations. Um, you can make a tea from the leaves and it has some healthy benefits. There's an up close shot of unripe mulberries forming. This is a dioecious or dioecious tree, which means there's male and female. So you want to get the female. It produces berries. Um, there's plenty enough male trees around that you don't need to plant two trees. You can plant one female tree, and, th and this would be the case where it's good to like have a nursery that's taking cuttings, right? So you know what you're, you know you're getting a fruit-bearing tree because it's a genetic, it's the same genetics. It's a cutting of a tree that produces. It takes root, and then you have another small tree with the same genetics. So you know what's going to produce. It's a really good way to propagate mulberries, and you can do that just by trimming. Uh, the tips of the branches, sticking them in water for a couple weeks, let the roots really start to, they'll just start forming after a couple weeks in water, then you can just about put it in the ground and you can grow your own mulberry tree from just tips of wild mulberries. Um, just keep it moist, don't let it dry out. So yeah, uh, underripe fruit, you're not going to want to consume, as with most things. So look for that deeply pigmented berry. This is a, the Kind of the way this has little cells, right? It almost looks like a stretched out blackberry with like little hairs, kind of like a strawberry. Well, that's called an aggregate berry and that multiple cells. So a blueberry is a smooth berry. It's not an aggregate berry. Mulberry is an aggregate berry. So if you're just looking for a way to describe what a mulberry looks like, it's botanically described as an aggregate berry. And most aggregate berries in the Southeast are safe to eat. Not 100%. You know, that's not the case with like smooth berries like blueberries. Poison ivy has little blueberries that are smooth. You know, there's a lot of little berries out there that you don't want to consume. But the aggregate berries are almost always edible. Just as a generic rule, though don't always just go with the one rule. Next plant. This was all just right here by the creek. Or by the river, rather. Did anybody recognize it? Oh. Looks a lot like clover, and that's what everybody says. And that's not a bad guess. Um, this is commonly confused with clover. But one thing I see that's a little bit different about clover is I've never seen clover with these little yellow flower remnants. So that's just a little bit different. But even if you don't know what a clover flower looks like, the main thing we can look at is that this has true heart-shaped leaves. So I call this, me and my little girl call this our little heart-shaped friend. So look at that, three heart-shaped leaves. Clovers may sometimes appear to have a heart-shaped leaf, but almost in reality, 99% of your clover leaves are not heart-shaped, they're round, but they are in leaves of three like this. Now, this plant is edible and so are clovers. So it's really not important if you make that mistake, which is always nice. If you make a mistake, you're just gonna be eating something else that's edible, whether you got clover or wood sorrel. Wood sorrel is what I call this. There are many other sorrels. One other common sorrel is sheep sorrel. So if you want to, if you don't have wood sorrel, look up sheep sorrel. You might have it growing in your weed spaces, your garden area, in an unsprayed area of the lawn. If you, you know, you don't spray, you'll have all kinds of nice stuff in there. Oxalis species, and this is, um, so all the sorrels are edible and the oxalis species, it's kind of good to know that, that genus name because every plant in that family has a high oxalate content or oxalic acid. And you may not be familiar with oxalates and you may not need to be, but a lot of wild greens are high in oxalates. And if you've ever had or known anybody that has not, that like doesn't eat spinach because of the oxalate content. So it's in, it's in a lot of leafy greens. And the main reasons to be careful with high oxalates is it can, it can cause um, disruptions in the body. For most people that have problems with it, it's going to be uh, kidney stones, you know, gallbladder stones, things like that in the body. So there's certain people out there that intentionally avoid high oxalate foods. I'm just throwing that out there that the oxalis genus or all the sorrels have a high oxalate content. Now that's really nice because that, ox that oxalic acid tastes like lemon. You eat this plant, has anybody ever consumed wood sorrel? Is it called 
Sourgrass, yeah, because it's so sour and lemony, it's, it's really tasty. Children really like it. Um, and like I said, the biggest mistake you're going to make is you're going to end up eating a clover and it's going to be pretty bland. So this is a pretty safe plant to forage. And we didn't have flowers yesterday, but it's got little yellow flowers. And this will come up, at, up to my knee if it comes up in my garden bed or something where there's nice soil. It'll actually get tall and you're not mowing it down, but it'll totally exist in a mowed lawn as well, real low to the ground. Um, so the whole part, in fact, the entire plant is edible from root to flower to seed pod to leafy green. Now this isn't something that's going to sustain you for a long time, but it's a great little addition to salads. And the, the most common recipe I hear from old timers around here is that they would sprinkle it on fish. It's like the lemon on your fish. Now I don't cook, I don't cook the leaves of this and this is what I'm collecting. I just, sometimes I'll just go up and rip, a, rip up a whole plant and then go inside and pick the leaves off because it's absolutely coming up everywhere. And you don't cook with it, but you add it after you're done because the heat's going to dissipate that oxalic acid a lot. So you just kind of add it as a, as a garnish or a, just a good trail nibble as you're going down the road or the, the trail, I guess more so, but it does grow on the roadsides. So wood sorrel, like I said, there's several other species in the oxalis genus that are edible in the Southeast here. Okay. This should be easy. Nobody. Black walnut, that's definitely at the park downtown. And I've definitely seen people picking up black walnuts at the park downtown. And there's good reason for it. I'm, I'm really glad to see people picking up black walnuts. So it's got a really dark, almost blackish bark that runs up and down vertically. And then once again, you have this compound leaf. So these are leaflets. These are individual leaflets on one big leaf. A little tricky to identify at first if you don't know the difference between a leaf and a leaflet and it's it's not a good way to learn it through pictures you're just gonna have to come outside sometime come out to my place and we can pick the plants apart and learn the difference so these are these have these nuts on them right now this is a picture from yesterday so it's certain it's almost season for the black walnuts um black walnuts have been eaten for years and years and years so it's a good primary food source in the wild. Um, nuts in general allowed civilization to move further inland away from water systems because we had fish, we have aquatic creatures that's really good in oils and fats that are really accessible and they just it's kind of like there for the taking. Well further inland the nuts provide those oils and fats that store really really well. The Iroquois Nation which is a little further than the south there in the northeast over the Great Lakes area they would um, rely heavily on hickory nuts to get them through winter. So much that every family would have a supply of hickory nuts before going into winter. It was made sure of. Nations would put down their battles to gather the hickory nuts. Same with acorns in the south and the acorns in California. Um, but back to black walnuts, it's really close to the hickory and, they're, and, and I'm gonna talk to them a little bit together because you can pick them both up off the ground, bust open that nut and you can eat them. And they're, and they're not, they don't taste bad. They taste pretty good, right? I mean, nuts, nuts in general are good. Um, in this case, you might have some brown stained fingers, you know, if you're getting into those black walnuts and that's been used as a dye. So for dyeing cotton, it'll get close to my shirt color. Um, aside from eating the walnuts themselves, which it takes a very hard nutcracker to bust. I've heard everything from rolling over them with your car, if you have a lot of them. Um, taking them, wrap, putting them in a pillowcase and, you know, hitting it with a hammer, things like that. You know, the, the important part is you get it busted open so you can get that nut meat out of there. Um, there are some, you know, crank, really heavy duty crank grinders that can take the black walnut. They're kind of pricey. The one other way I know of obtaining black walnuts would be through the squirrels because the squirrels love these too. And interestingly enough, if your, you know, if your neighbor has a black walnut tree, but he's a little grouchy and, you know, don't know what you'd be out there picking out of his yard, you know, well, that's okay. You can just build a sand pit on your side of the fence and the squirrels really like an easy spot to dig. So they'll go take, they'll take his black walnuts and they'll bury them in your sand pit. And it's even better because squirrels don't often pick bad nuts. And us humans, we don't, you know, we're, you're going to have to toss out a certain percentage. So the... The acorns, I mean, excuse me, the squirrels will 
help you in a couple other ways. If you have a five gallon bucket full of walnuts, and you've, if you've ever left them on the porch, because maybe you're harvesting them, maybe me and my wife will dye textiles with uh, the holes. So you, you leave them there and the next thing you know, it's been raided, of course. The squirrels are hopping in the bucket. Well, if you keep it about half full, they'll keep the holes in the bucket and they'll just take the nut. So if you're after the holes for medicine or for craft use, that's a really easy way to just have a bucket full of holes after a few days. Okay, and if you have that sand pit, maybe they'll go bear the, the nuts over there. So they do all the work for you again. Squirrels act really positively to nut trees. In fact, I would venture to say they've been cultivating these nut trees for millions of years. And we are taking advantage of that now because they cultivated, they wanted the biggest, best production, right? And they go bury that and it plants the nut tree. So the, the squirrels aren't, um, you know, parasitic to the nut trees. It's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. Tincturing the green, like see how this is still green right here? So this is too ripe to pick for the nut probably. You want the, you want the black walnut to fall on the ground and you pretty much pick that up. And if you've got a lot going, there are sophisticated machines that you roll around and they'll help you collect nuts if you're really getting into it. But these are fairly easy to collect by hand. Wear gloves if you don't want your hands stained brown. But at this stage when they're still green, before they start turning brown and getting all these black dots, I like to take a little bit, I don't really even do it every year, but every few years, I'll take some of those green holes and I'll put them in alcohol. Not to have fun, because alcohol I don't really consider that fun, but I want to make, I want to extract compounds out of that black walnut hole, in the green walnut hole, and it's called making a tincture. It's a very common herbal preparation, and those tinctures are very antifungal and antiparasitic. You can, you can do the research study on this. I'm not a doctor, so don't just listen to what I say, do your own research. Um, but it makes really good medicine and the most common use for that was for ringworm on the skin. Just topical application of a black walnut tincture, the green holes like you see here. It's really easy to do. About 50% alcohol content is a good place to be with that. Um, let's see, I think that's about it on the black walnut. Really, really good food source. And if we had to rely just on local foods to provide all our needs, Black walnuts would be very high. These were planted by um, settlers some time ago all over the southeast, knowing that they probably would never get to really enjoy a good nut harvest, but we can really benefit from that. Maybe we should be planting a few more large nut trees, or trees that can become large nut trees as well. So there's really good stand down at the park, but I think they go pretty quick. Oh yeah, land-based source of iodine. I'll touch on that briefly. Iodine is a, a necessary nutrient. It helps, uh, it helps a lot of things in the body, especially pertaining to thyroid function. So it's necessary and it most often comes from the sea or seaweed, sea vegetables. So to have a land-based source of iodine is really great. Some of that iodine probably comes out in the tincture. Okay, if I had to show you one plant, this would probably be the plant to show you. You may recognize. Plantain, some sort of rattlesnake or just plantain? Plantain. We'll go with plantain. We won't call it rattlesnake plantain because that would not be a true plantain or plantago. So I'm talking about several species in the plantago genus, and this is this is either broadleaf plantain or a native plantain, plantago rutelli. It really doesn't matter. There are two or three to familiarize yourself with. And once you get to know them, they're really easy to identify. This is most certainly growing in the waste area here. You see right on the concrete in the sand. In fact, this is kind of hard to get to grow in your garden. Um, but what we'll notice here are these are seed pods coming in. And these veins right here, you have really prominent veins that go from the tip all the way to the base. There's only four or five on a small leaf like this. There's never many. And if you was to take that leaf and kind of pick it apart slowly, those veins would remain and you can kind of sit there and, and, and dangle the, the green leafy part on those little veins. So they're pretty stout and you kind of pick the part, of, pick a, the leaf apart to see those. That's a good way to identify it. And I have another picture here. So it grows in the lawn. It doesn't mind being cut. You can see it's seeding just below the mow level. So it's really resilient in that way. It's a good food source and also a good medicine source. So plantain, this isn't like plantain um, as far as banana go, because this, that would be different, different country, different plant, but plantago species, 
Um, like I say, broadleaf or narrow leaf plantain are the two most common. This is what we call a nature's band-aid. And we call it that for several reasons, including compounds like tannins and allotoin that are really beneficial for promoting new cell growth and anti-inflammatory. So I said violets might be good to put in a little salve for cuts and scrapes, but plantain would be the base for that. If I only had one plant to use, it would be plantain for skin um, inflammation and other skin ailments. So it's, it's good for the skin, but it's good to eat too. This is another good leafy green. Now because of those veins, those fibers on the inside, I typically use scissors and I'll just cut this up. I'll gather a whole bunch of it. I'll cut it up and throw it in just about anything for a little added nutrients. Um, nutrient profile similar to dandelion. Has anybody heard about some of the news stories? Dandelion's getting pretty popular as a wild edible because it's so nutritious. I would venture to say, you know, somewhere in the realm of 10 times more nutritious than anything you'll buy in the grocery store. I mean, there's a huge, huge difference between these wild green and cultivated greens. So, you know, and, and that being said, start small, right? Because these are, this will be a, a little bit of a shock to our body to consume something so rich in phytochemicals. So the seed pod here, I have here the seeds contain psyllium. Psyllium is a laxative like in Metamucil, and these seeds are often implemented just for that. Um, I, I just eat the top inch or two of the seeds in the springtime when they're light green in, in color. And that's not something I do for, you know, put in my meal, but I might nibble on it here and there for certain compounds or particularly for that, uh, that psyllium effect, that laxative effect. So this one you can completely eat raw if you need to, but I'm a fan of cooking food. It makes it a little more bioavailable in my mind. Um, yeah, so plantain, the, the number one plant, first plant everyone should know. I'll give you a couple quick ways to use it just in everyday life, especially if you have children and they're outside they're playing, they get a bug bite. Well, hopefully, at least in my yard, there's plantain within about 50 feet of any place in the yard, especially the gravel driveway. It really likes packed hard soils. It's had the nickname white man's foot because it followed road beds and packed hard soil of the European settlers. And they brought a few species over with them. Um, but there were a few, few species here and they can all be used interchangeably. This is by far the most common, the broadleaf plantain. And these are small uh, specimens. They can get, you know, the leaf size could be two or three times that size. It can be a pretty big leafy green. So if you have a bug bite, you can simply tear up part of the plant and used to, it would have been commonplace just to chew on that for a minute and do what we call a spit poultice. And that might sound kind of gross, but it's one time where somebody told you you could spit on your wound. You know, if you're into that, chew up a little plantain. It really helps extract some of those chemicals. The saliva even breaks it down a little bit. It's better than just ripping it up with your hand, though. If you are in a spot you're not familiar with and you don't want to put the plant in your mouth, you could simply pick it off the ground, rip it up with your hand and put it on the bite, especially ant bites and bee stings that have formic acid, it neutralizes that acid very quickly. There will be, there are many people that will that have testimonies that it is better than anything you can buy in the store. And this grows absolutely everywhere in the U.S., but particularly in L.J., the Southeast, etc. So learn to identify this plant. You'll always have a remedy for bug bites nearby. It can stop all of the swelling and reaction and inflammation from wasp stings if you get to it soon enough. Sometimes I use a little bit of speed, a little bit of hustle to get the plantain there because the, the quicker you can neutralize it, the less inflammatory response your body has. The way I like to use it, if I know I'm not going to be around it, I'll take a bunch of plantain leaves, I'll put them in a mason jar. I fill it about half full with fresh plantain leaves. I'll pour in almost boiling water. I don't get crazy and make my water as hot as I can. It doesn't need to be super hot, but I pour in almost boiling water and I fill up my mason jar. And after that cools down, I'll put it in the fridge. And then that way, when one of your children or yourself gets stung by a bite, you go to the fridge, you grab out a lump of that cold plantain water and it's really soothing because it's been chilled because it neutralizes that acid. It's a really, really good remedy to, to know. Nature's Band-Aid. You can turn it into all, all the way into a salve, but the other way I like to use it is simply put, in this case, I might use dried plantain leaves. 
or I could use fresh, but fresh, you have a higher moisture content, so things go rancid when there's water in them. So I like to use dried plantain and I'll put it in olive oil. And I'll, you know, I'll fill my jar up with dried plantain and I'll just cover it barely with olive oil. And I'll let that sit for 30 to 60 days in a dark space. And I'll shake it occasionally. And, this, and that oil will turn rich green color. And it's extracting a lot of those chemicals. And then you can just strain out your plant material and you're carrying around an oil that's really great on the skin. Really great for those bug bites. I think fresh is probably the fastest acting application, but oil would be second. Oil is a lot easier to carry around. To turn that oil into a salve, you just add beeswax to make it thicker. So many, and, and like I say, I eat this in scrambled eggs, things like that is where I get a lot of throw in a lot of wild greens every morning. It's a great way to, to start the day. Um, good, good for so much, so many things, so many things, very nutritious. Okay, I think I have to speed up just a little here. We've got a couple more plants at least. Um, do we recognize this as thorns all up and down the branches here? Thorns here, thorns on the leaves. Blackberry? Blackberry cane, right? And I don't really want to talk about blackberries because they're okay. Has anybody eaten blackberries right off the, the vine? What do we think about the taste? Yeah, I get some shoulder shrugs. You know, it's pretty good. Yeah, I'll eat them if I had to, you know. I'm not, you know, make a jam or a jelly, that'd be really good. You know, add a little sweetener, it's really good. So I found these blackberries all over, and that's, of course, a really good food source. But there's something better lurking in the woods a little bit deeper. And it has thorns on it, too. And it has the same, you know, these are serrated margins or serrated leaf edges. And it's a compound leaf, a palmately compound, because there's five little leaflets. And on here, we have some of that same compound and serrated nature. Sometimes it looks like there's three, maybe five thorny vine. So there's some similarities to blackberry here, but let's look at what's different than the blackberry cane. For one, this cane is very woody and, and stem-like, right? This cane, on the other hand, is almost glowing in the bushes here. And it's not a filter or effect I put on. Uh, it really is like that. But you can kind of see, if you can see in the blurriness, the, the little bit of that white film, that fungal powder of sorts, it can actually be rubbed off this stem and it comes on on these first year growths. So if you have something you're getting tangled in that kind of feels like blackberries, but it has these light blue stems and you can rub that and you rub on the stem just right there, like, like right here, a little browner and it's a little brown right there where it's, something's rubbed it, this white powdery substance rubbed off. And if you can start to, to identify that, you'll be looking at a black raspberry, which are much, much better. They pale, or blackberries pale in comparison to the black raspberries. So it does have a similar shape to a blackberry, but let's notice something different. If you can think back to your childhood, probably when you were picking blackberries, when you pick one, they still have the stem on them, right? It's like a mulberry. I don't want to go all the way back, but the mulberries, they still have a little stem on them. And most people just pop them in their mouth anyways. If you try to pick out the stem, you kind of just squish things and make a mess. But these have no stem. This is a perfect example right here. They have no stem on them. So this is a true thimble berry. Thimble like you wear on your thumb for pushing needles through or sewing. So it's a thimble berry, which means it leaves its little stem on the plant. And that's the biggest difference in the physical berry between a blackberry and the multitude of blackberry species and the one black raspberry species we have in the southeast. Rubus occidentalis or something like that. That. So you're looking, if you're finding these true thimble berries, in, in, at my place these grow right, right beside entangled in the blackberries. I guarantee you some people have been picking blackberries and been picking both and not even, you know, care to notice the difference. But these are a lot sweeter and have no bitter, any type of bitter aftertone or aftertaste or anything like that. Some people call them black caps, depending on where you grew up at. Um, so yeah, these are all over LJ, and once again, it was down at the park. You look for this really shiny stem, and if you notice here, I've taken the picture of a backside of the leaf, and it's kind of hard to tell because of the way the lighting is, but if I would have turned over this leaf, it would be almost as white as that stem. In the same way, this is almost as white as that stem. So it's, it's ghostly white if you look at the underside of the plant. And that has to do with chlorophyll and the sun shining down and getting reflected back through the leaf. So, most of your plants have a lighter underside and a darker top side, 
but this one really stands out. And I happen to really happen to find out there's a lot less thorns on this than there are blackberries. The blackberry canes get pretty vicious around here, get really tall, really thick thorns, but this grows in kind of a looping pattern. I've seen it come up and the tip of this plant loves to droop down and actually connect and go back in the ground. So you have these and it starts rooting and then it sends up another shoot and this plant will bounce around, try to catch more sunlight, things like that. So it doesn't quite get the, the stature of blackberry. It's not as thorny. And if you really just can't deal with the thorns, there are cultivars that are thornless for the black raspberries. So this is really good eating. And, it, and it, it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be right beside the blackberries, roadsides, power line cuts, things like that. Um, this is all over. I hadn't seen this till I come up a little bit higher in the mountains. So blackberry is more prevalent, but this is a lot better tasting. And they ripen, I believe these ripen just before the blackberries. So you have to catch them a little bit sooner. And there's other dewberries and things like that that just trail along the ground. But like I said, most of those aggregate berries, these multiple cell berries are safe and you really don't have to take the time to know the species exactly. So black raspberries. This is one I'll just kind of touch on briefly because it was a really, it was really prominent and it was flowering right there on the river. Does anybody happen to know this one? I like to guess, but we'll, we'll go with, um, it's a type of cone flower. Cone flower, it really indicates the shape of the flower heads. And this isn't like purple cone flower, echinacea, some of y'all are hopefully familiar with. It's a really great, wonderful plant, but it's got a really prominent cone on that flower. This one isn't as, you know, isn't as prominent, but we still call it a cone flower. The other thing I'll point out is this is one leaf, and so is that. So that's a huge difference, right? This is one leaf and this is one leaf. So the leaf shape isn't gonna help you here. And that's why this plant really isn't for beginning foraging, but it is really abundant in LJ. And I'm um, and I'm kind of telling you about it because it was such a prized green for the Cherokee. And they really um, like to harvest it and they would eat it in the springtime. So this is what I call Sochan or Sochani. It's technically like a rutabecchia in that coneflower family in the asters. Um, Sochan or Sochani, one other name for it would be green-headed coneflower. I like the purple-headed coneflower, green-headed coneflower. The reason, it's pretty easy to identify at this stage because you have the flowers and you have the multiple leaf shapes. You have the overall stature, which is four or five feet high, sometimes bigger. And it's kind of easy to identify, but at this stage, there's nothing edible. So it's no good to us. But in the early, early springtime, and I'm going to tell you, I would not eat this leaf either, but in the early, early springtime, it'll send up a nice cluster of just basil leaves. And when I say basil leaves, I just mean they're still on the ground. It doesn't have this large stalk that carries the flower because you don't want the leaves up on the stalk. You want the basil rosette leaves that come up in the springtime. The Cherokee would eat this right alongside poke salad. It was a cooked green eaten in the early springtime. It was known as a good cleansing green. So you don't have to take medicine, but in your food every springtime you get a nice cleanse because you eat some of these more potent greens that you can eat later in the year. You eat them when they're fresh and green. Like when you go out to your garden and you pick some chard or kale or something like that, you don't get the old, old bitter leaves that are laying on the dirt. You go for that nice green that snaps really easily. And that's what you would need to find in this plant, that fresh growth that snaps off really easily. Once again, I'm not going to give you a whole lot of identifying factors because it can be really tricky. And if you're just looking at leaves like this, there are some toxic plants that may fool you before it flowers. So it's one of those things that if you have it on your property and want to take advantage of good nutrient dense food, you can learn it while it's flowering and learn it over the cycle of a year or two years. So that in that third year, when it comes up, you say, hey, I know that's so chan. Because it's a perennial, it'll come back from the same root every year. So learn a patch while it's flowering and then go back in the springtime to harvest. And study this one for a couple years before you really get crazy. Somebody's gotta know this one. Besides you, you're good. <laughs> Somebody else, give it to me. Is that the beauty berry? Poke no, not beauty poke. berry. Pokeweed. Poke, yeah, poke berry. Goes by a lot of names. These are some that I commonly hear. Poke, poke, poke salad, poke salad, right? 
You see the red stem, that's really prominent. At the park it had flowers and it had berries just three days ago. So this is, this is what you'll see right now. The leaf shape is large and ovate, smooth. So let's look at these names for just a minute. Do, do we, is this plant toxic or do we eat it? Both, right? You probably heard about somebody eating this and in the South it was very popular to consume this. And you've probably also been scared away and said that it's you know toxic and probably not even to touch it. And so why would we call it poke salad if it's toxic to eat? It's because, you know, us Southerners don't always have the most or the best pronunciation, right? And the original term was probably poke salad, which means completely different than salad. Cooked, cooked until tender. So we don't, so I don't like to call it poke salad, even though you will definitely hear that name. I call it poke salad if I'm going to say that. You poke salad, poke salad, you really can't hear the difference if I just say it in conversation. So you can see how the mistake was made, but it's not salad. Absolutely not. Not be fun. But it is salad. It, it can be cooked until tender. And when it's really fresh and in the springtime, it'll emerge from the ground and it'll have this really easy to snap off stem and it'll have all these leaves that are just pointing up towards the sky. And that'd be about the time you want to collect it, when it snaps off really easily. Technically, the stem and the leaves can be eaten. And this has been canned and put in grocery stores. So there is toxicity here but it, it's been eaten by civilization for many, many, many years. The main thing is to take those fresh, tender growth, that fresh, tender green, and boil it in, two, in a couple changes of water. You boil it until it's no longer bitter. You boil it till it's palatable. So I bring my water up to boil, I dump that water, I pour in fresh water, I bring that up to boil, I dump it, and then maybe I eat it. And that seems like a lot of work for food, and it kind of is, but this, was just like Sochan, this was one of the top five Cherokee greens. So for whatever reason, they took the time to properly prepare it, probably because of those health benefits and because of how prevalent it can be. I know early settlers would carry this around with them. It's kind of seen as a weed nowadays, but people used to take it to new home sites, new homesteads, um, take seed with them so that they could have this luscious green plant that comes up in the spring. So beyond just eating the leaves, um, when prepared properly is every part of this plant can be used in the modern herbal practice and is commonly used. The root is the most dangerous part and I don't suggest messing with it. Um, the berries are a really common medicine and they're actually recommended a lot for arthritic complaints. And one of the most common recipes I hear is just simply to take one or two berries, swallow it like a pill. I know it sounds like I might be telling you to do something dumb and you should do your own research, but I can say that I have ingested more than a handful of berries and, and I'm here talking to you, but that doesn't mean much. Um, and I know a lot of people that have, and I know herbalists that are more well known, much more well known than myself, who have made pulpberry pies and jellies and jams. In fact, I've heard that elderberry hospitalizes more people than pulpberry every year. That's probably just the conception that elderberries are safe and something that you might just eat while pokeberries are regarded as toxic. The toxic part of pokeberries, just like elderberries, are the seed. And the most um, important factor about that seed is that if you break it open, it could be deadly toxic. So that's a good reason to avoid it in general. I understand that. There's a lot of good reasons not to avoid it. And you hear, you hear very commonly that our teeth cannot break open the seeds. And I won't chew the berries anyways. I have chewed a berry and it's very bitter and nasty. So just swallow them like a pill after a lot of research and maybe just go see an herbal practitioner before you do that too. And make sure it works well with your body. Once again, I'm not a doctor. But a lot of people, I know people personally and I know more people that know lots of people that use this medicine daily. Two berries a day for 30 days, something like that. So there has been a lot of kids probably taken to the emergency room over a little pokeberry <laughs> smears on their mouth, probably unnecessarily. Now, if you could crush the seeds, that would be bad, but in the form of taking a pill for arthritic complaints and, and a lymphatic cleanse, you leave the seed in there. It's gonna pass right through the system. 
but you kind of want what's on the outside of that seed. There's often really strong compounds. And for eating though, if you're making a jam or a jelly, you're gonna to wanna to remove that seed and you're definitely not gonna to wanna to use any type of mortar and pestle or any type of hard crushing motion, right? You know, we just wanna strain the seed out after some light beating, but do it just like the elderberry. You can make a pulpberry syrup just like elderberry syrup. You heat it up, you remove the seeds, you strain it, add your honey, it's the same thing. So people also use this in tincture all the time. I guess the, the message here is just to know that some things that are generally regarded as really toxic and hey, don't touch this, are just, you know, have really just been kind of mislabeled. Because this is a, a plant that provides medicine at any time of the year and food in the early spring. It was, I know a lot of herbalists that say they, if they could have one plant for their medicine cabinet, it would be folk. Okay, it's hugely important medicine. It's not just in folk herbalists, but in science, there's studies that link this to um, aiding with uh, cancer and other things. It's a very, very powerful plant. I'm just trying to shed a little bit of that fear about poke. It's obviously good for the wildlife as well. And yeah, you can make a little paint or a pigment, you know, painting that stuff on your skin is not gonna hurt anything. Kids, you know, mash that up and make a nice little paint. Okay, so just remember, you know, you do wanna know what you're doing with this plant. And certain parts are very toxic. The berries not so much, but don't crush the seeds. See what time it is. We may have to skip just a few things. I wanted a kind of closing conversation. We're right at an hour. Uh, let's see what all I have in here. That's it. Oh, mushrooms. We all want to talk about that. Um, let's just cover one more garden, uh, garden weed, supposedly, and then I'll kind of do a roundup conversation. Has anybody seen this popping up in their gardens or in their yards? Little pink flower heads, right? This is pretty easy to identify. There's not too many toxic lookalikes, or there's not any at all that I know of. This is what we call smart weed. I'm not really sure how it got that name, but it will absolutely take over if you let it. And you'll have, this could be your whole lawn <laughs> if you let it take over. And it wouldn't be a bad lawn because it's entirely edible, the aerial portions of this plant. So the green leaves can, once again, these are kind of small scrawny leaves. When it grows in my garden, it gets nice, big and lush, you know, because all the compost and things like that. Um, but you can substitute this for any dark leafy green in any recipe whatsoever. It's pretty mild. Actually, raw, it has a little bit of a peppery taste to it. I just heard about somebody using, I've not tried this, so maybe somebody try it and, and let me know, email me, to grab these little seed heads and fry them in a pan like little fairy popcorn. So just these little popcorn popping off these little seed heads. So and I know it's edible, but I've never tried to fry it. I have nibbled on it here and there. I don't really actually know the exact species on this, but in this case, not all the polygonomes are edible, but the smart weed here that you find around here is with those pink flower heads. We won't talk about the cherry trees, because that would be a long subject, or the hog nuts. I'll come back to that. I'll put that up there for now. There's the little Facebook and the website, which is under construction right now and uh, an entire mess and there's a bunch of broken links. So I apologize, give me a couple weeks to work with people to get the website better. So you can't hardly even tell what's going on right now. And I'll make that more clear in a couple weeks. Um, but in general, what did we cover? Maybe just seven or eight plants today, but I had about a dozen species up on the slideshow here. And I found at least two dozen species of edible plants in about 30 minutes at the park. Uh, maybe 45 minutes just going around taking pictures. And that is a place that we said earlier is not primed for diversity, is not primed for good food plants. In fact, it's probably the opposite. They're mowing it, they're weeding it, and they're spraying it. So imagine what we can do with our lawns if we actually shoot for diversity and shoot for edible plants, okay? We can all, like this many people in this room, can go a long way to creating a food resilient community. And I use that word again because I think it's important to think about um, where your food comes from, where your nutrition is, and to get as much as local as possible. So I, this is really just a tiny, tiny scratch on the surface. Um, please come out if you want to know more. I do private walks and then we have events. There's free walks the third Sunday of every month this year and next year I may switch that up a little bit and do it at a different time. Um, I think this next one's about full, so maybe I have to hop on next week.